Good afternoon and welcome to the A4LE session on identifying energy savings opportunities using virtual audits. My name is Yash Pinapati. I'm a program manager at Wildan. My background is in mechanical engineering. I have worked in the energy efficiency space for a little over six years now. Wildan is a contractor for Duke Energy in North and South Carolina and in Indiana. For Duke Energy, Wildan manages two offerings under the Smart Saver Custom Program. New Construction Energy Efficient Design Assistance and Virtual Energy Assessments. Here is the agenda for today's session. We will talk about virtual assessments, the process, benchmarking, um, measures that we can assess under a virtual assessment, the pros and cons of a traditional energy audit, pros and cons of a virtual energy audit, and we also have two case studies pertaining to educational institutions, one of which is a community college, and the second case study is about a junior high school. So what are virtual energy assessments? Virtual energy assessments are is a Duke Energy incentive offering that provides an in-depth energy analysis of existing buildings to identify key opportunities to help lower energy costs and also evaluate the financial impact of facility improvements. This is an offering available for all Duke Energy commercial customers that are opted in to the energy efficiency rider. So what is offered with a virtual assessment? A virtual assessment, as mentioned previously, is a whole building energy analysis. So unlike a traditional rebate program, um, with a virtual energy analysis, we look at the building uh, we, as a whole, and we provide uh, a holistic view of the building, and thereby we are able to analyze um, energy efficiency strategies that pertain to the whole building. Here are some of the benefits associated with a virtual assessment. The first step uh, benefit is a benchmark analysis. This analysis is, of, is particularly useful if the customer has a lot of buildings on campus, such as a school district or a large college um, facility with a lot of buildings on campus. The other benefits are mostly uh, just about the virtual process, um, which completely eliminates the need for in-person meetings. Um, it is a more streamlined audit process um, and then has a quick turnaround time. So what is a benchmark analysis and what are some situations when it would be helpful? So a benchmarking is nothing but taking a look at the energy use of a particular building and comparing it either against a code or against other buildings that have a similar space makeup and use. A benchmark analysis is of particular help for educational institutions that have a lot of buildings on campus such as colleges, school districts, that which may have a lot of school buildings. A benchmark study also helps estimate savings potential, and it also helps identify candidates for a detailed energy study. Here on this slide, um, you will see a benchmark study that we did for one of the buildings on campus. Um, 
practiced explaining what these different metrics on this screen mean. A 2.5 stars means that the building is operating exactly as the benchmark. Anything lower than that shows that the building has some potential for savings. Of course, the lower that metric, the higher the savings potential. Running a benchmark analysis on all buildings uh, that are part of a larger campus can help identify what buildings need to be targeted first for a more detailed energy audit. As shown in this example, this was building two on campus. Um, this particular facility was actually operating uh, quite well compared to the benchmark. It was using less energy as compared to the benchmark and therefore it was not a candidate for a detailed energy analysis. Here is an example of the different measures that can be assessed through a virtual assessment. Of course, there is the, the usual low-hanging fruit of lighting LED upgrades and lighting controls. Um, and since this is a whole building energy model, uh, we are also able to analyze um, ECMs such as HVAC efficiency improvements, HVAC controls, um, whether it is DDC system upgrades, fan pump, supply air, and hot water resets, outside air reductions, building envelope strategies, and a lot more. This is an example of how the virtual audit works for Duke Energy. The process starts with an online application, and then the analysis is done completely online. Um, there is a collaborative meeting with real-time model adjustments with the customers. And then should the customer decide to go ahead with, a, with an upgrade, um, there is also assistance with uh, incentive paperwork and the like. In the next two slides, I will compare and contrast the pros and, co uh, and cons associated with both a traditional energy audit and a virtual energy audit. First, let's look at the pros for a traditional energy audit. Since the traditional energy audit is an in-person event, there, there, is a, there is some interaction with the facility engineers and staff. This further enables the energy auditor to identify the real issues of the building and the systems. Um, the second big pro for this for the traditional energy audit is the ability to have eyes on the equipment. The auditor is able to analyze if uh, a particular equipment uh, is, is in a bad condition and thereby make recommendations on which of the equipment needs to be upgraded. The other big uh, advantage to doing a traditional energy audit is the ability to take photos, videos, deploy data loggers, or just take measurements that may come in handy uh, in the later stages. However, the traditional audits are usually time consuming. Um, and since it is an in-person event, um, the coordination of key facility team members takes time away from core job responsibilities. Oftentimes, an energy auditor needs to be escorted around a building particularly if they are accessing mechanical rooms um, or in other areas um, or in other secured areas. And of course, there is time associated with just traveling to the site uh, and back. And especially if a facility is uh, in a different city or state, uh, there is a time associated with air travel as well. And the other bigger drawback is just safety concerns, especially if an energy auditor has to work on a roof to take pictures of an equipment. There are some safety concerns associated with uh, things like that. And then others, other issues such as working our own ladders, loud noises, unfavorable weather, etc. 
Now we will look at the pros and cons of a virtual energy audit. Of course, as the name suggests, the process being virtual, there is no in-person interaction uh, or an in-person walkthrough of a facility. No security clearances are needed and no escorts are needed, um, even in secure areas. There is no lost travel time, um, very minimal safety risks, especially if the process is done completely online. And energy modeling results are accurate for most level one and level two audits. The drawbacks associated with this process though is that the data collection is heavily reliant on facility staff's knowledge of building systems. And there is a bit of a learning curve um, to get the on-site people up to speed with the virtual audit process. Of course, the pandemic helped since a lot of the events became uh, virtual. Um, it has helped us uh, in a way. People are now more used to having Zoom meetings and other virtual conferences. Um, so there is less of a learning curve these days um, about virtual audits. And of course, the other audit is the virtual audits are meant for a level one, level two analysis. It is not meant to take the place of a more detailed um, investment grade audit, which can also be called as an ASHRAE level three audit. So that being said, let's look at the two case studies. Um, these are two projects that I worked on um, as part of the Duke Energy's Virtual Energy Assessment Program. So the first case study is about a community college in Raleigh, North Carolina. I will give a first give a quick overview of of the building, um, what the customer was looking for, and then some background. And in the later slides, uh, we will look at uh, the results from the energy model, and then um, some other metrics associated with that. So this particular building, um, this particular community college, I think they had maybe five to seven buildings on campus. Um, then it was split across multiple meters. So for the first meter, there were, I think there were about four buildings on campus under one electric meter, um, amounting to a total square footage of about 118,000 square feet. Um, and this particular customer, it was a planned renovation of mechanical and lighting systems for them. So it was a project they knew that they had to do and um, they had worked with the um, with the board and everybody else to secure funding for the project. Um, and then of course, across those four buildings, there were offices, libraries, um, and of course, classrooms. Um, as for the operating schedule, it was functioning as a typical community college would. There was some amount of uh, summer occupancy as well, or, although not all buildings were used at their full capacity during the summer. As far as taking a better look at the uh, building uh, HVAC systems, um, they had a four pipe fan coil unit served by a gas fired boiler and an air cooled chiller. Um, from a lighting system standpoint, um, there was a mix of T8 and T12 fluorescent tubes in troughers and a mix of uh, CFL and incandescent bulbs um, and in a downlight fixture. So this particular setup is not too far off from what a typical college building would be, especially if it's one that hasn't been renovated in a while. Um, it's either a four pipe fan coil. If they have, the building has a, a central plant, um, usually um, they will have either a four pipe fan coil unit um, or a variable air volume system.
Just a little more background on why the community college was uh, going ahead with the upgrade. There was a lot of uh, ongoing maintenance issues with the air-cooled chillers. Um, and then another common problem in older buildings is the equipment is oftentimes oversized um, or just improperly sized. Um, so what that can do is cause a lot of uh, comfort issues, particularly at the zone level. Um, can also cause a lot of humidity issues. And then, of course, since they had fluorescent tubes, um, those tubes would, would go out every now and then, so it was um, it was burdensome for the facilities people to change out light fixtures. And um, so I mentioned previously that um, this was a planned renovation, so the, the college had already gone through the steps from a financing standpoint to secure the funding. But then their initial design plan was to just replace the chiller with another chiller. Um, but then, uh, since they were participating in the virtual audit, um, they also wanted to explore um, some options associated with decentralizing the HVAC system. What that means is instead of having a central chiller plant, um, we are decentralizing the system and thereby adding a bunch of uh, DX units, such as rooftop units on the roof. Um, and what this means for the facility staff is there was less maintenance to do, so they were particularly interested in um, if that option was going to be more energy efficient. And since this was a planned renovation, there was also a design team involved. There was already uh, an engineer on board, um, and that the design team was also looking for a quick way to explore um, different HVAC options. So as part of the virtual energy assessment process, we identified uh, six energy saving bundles. A bundle is nothing but just a group of energy efficiency strategies. And um, we had set up six different bundles for this particular customer. Three scenarios replacing the air-cooled chiller, and then three scenarios for replacing the chiller with a decentralized DX system. On this screen, you will you will see the um, results associated with the analysis. So the first three bundles pertain to replacing the existing air-cooled chiller with the newer air-cooled chiller. And then the last three options here towards the right of your screen, these pertain to the decentralized HVAC system. So um, here are some different metrics associated with each of the option. First, let me explain what um, the different bundles um, mean. So bundle one, bundle one, two, and three, they are incremental improvements over each other. And what that means is, for example, you could have a, an air cooled chiller that's maybe 5% better than the baseline unit. Um, that would be bundle one, and then bundles two and three will build on top of bundle one. So bundle two would show the energy savings associated by, by purchasing a chiller that's maybe 10% better than the baseline system, just for as an example. And there are, of course, lighting strategies as well. So as you can see, um, the energy savings by going by replacing the air cold chiller with another air cold chiller can be anywhere from 12,000 to about $18,000, which was anywhere from 20 to 30% of their energy cost savings. 
And of course, since this was a Duke Energy offering, there are some incentives uh, at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, Duke Energy does offer a one-time incentive. So uh, in addition, if you take the energy savings into account with the incentives, um, it does make um, for a favorable payback. Um, and then the um, since the team was most interested in doing what they could to reduce the maintenance cost, um, we also set up the bundle about the DX system. And uh, those systems turned out to be a little bit more um, efficient. So they had an ener starting energy cost savings of about $15,000, going all the way up to $22,000. So anywhere from 25 to 37% energy cost savings. This screen shows a snapshot of the energy usage for the uh, for the community college. The blue line at the top it shows the this one shows their current energy usage. This is this, of course, is electric usage only. Um, so roughly, they were at 1.6 million kilowatt hours, and by going with the middle option, like by going with bundle two for air cool chiller and with bundle four, bundle five for the DX system, they were able to. This is a projection of where they can get their energy to be. So. It can go from 1.6 million all the way to 1.38 million um, and then which of course translated to about um, 14 to 17 thousand dollars in energy cost savings so we presented these results to the design team um, and the um, and of course had a great discussion with the on-site staff the design team and the owners um, and after looking at all the numbers it um, the, the owner made a decision to go with the decentralized system not only for the cost savings associated with it but also for the lower um, maintenance costs that they would incur on a on a towards the life cycle of that product So some impacts um, for that particular college. Um, so any educational institution that is considering a planned renovation, um, there's definitely a lot of uh, benefits to taking advantage of a virtual energy analysis. Um, the first thing is the design team had did not have the time to analyze different systems. So it, it was really in the customer's benefit to have a third party analyze the different HVAC systems and identify what the best option was. And since this is an analysis on an existing building, it was um, an energy analysis based on their last two years of usage. So it was a real analysis. Um, it was an energy model built off of the behavior of that institution, their schedules, um, their exact efficiency of the units and all that. So it was real savings that they could see, provided they were operating the build, provided they would operate the building the same way as they were before, from a from a from a scheduling and operation standpoint. And the last one is more Duke Energy specific, but uh, there are some advantages to going with a whole full building model analysis. Um, there are, the incentives are usually higher um, when you compare the custom program with the prescriptive offering. So that was case study one. That was a community college. Um, so here I have another case study. Um, and this one, again, is an educational institution. It is a junior high school in Indiana. Um, so this this is a more typical customer, um, and you'll know what I mean when we um, run through the other slides. 
So this particular building, it is uh, it was a junior high school, just one building, uh, a fairly large school at about 183,000 square feet. Um, and as far as uh, usage, it was it had a typical school usage, the usual eight nine hours a day, um, with uh, with partial summer occupancy even to to accommodate like summer camps and other sports activities. Um, the school was spending anywhere between one hundred and eighty to one hundred and ninety thousand dollars a year on energy costs. So roughly, it's it's about a dollar per square feet, which is pretty high for a for a school. Um, so this school was kind of similar to the other case example in the case study, um, in that they also had a central plant. Um, however, this particular school had a water cool chiller um, and a gas boiler with hot water reheat, um, and it's a variable air volume system. Here's a little bit more information about the school. Um, so this school had a, actually the school district had a, had a facilities manager and they also had an energy manager. So they were well, well versed in the uh, energy efficiency measures. Um, so they had a plan, uh, they wanted to be more energy efficient a uh, couple of years down the line but the way they were going about it, there was not like a set plan on things they wanted to do. It was more about, you know, like uh, if they had some extra dollars, they would put that towards energy efficiency strategies. Although the strategies that they initially implemented did cause energy savings, um, it just wasn't large enough to make a significant dent on the annual energy use. Um, the third bullet here, um, the, of course, this is pretty typical with uh, with any school district. Um, so usually with community school districts, the budget cycles are fairly long. Um, and especially larger projects, uh, ones that involve, um, you know, full mechanical and lighting renovation they need. Uh, pre-approval from the school board. Usually that can be anywhere from one to two years before the project even happens. Um, and then another interesting thing about this school building was that they did have uh, a decent HVAC control system. Um, however, it was maintained by the contractor, so the actual facility staff um, did not really um, do anything as far as set points were concerned. They just kind of assumed that uh, since the contractors were maintaining it, they, they knew what they were doing. Um, and although it was, they had some schedules, uh, it still wasn't, uh, um, it still wasn't enough. There was room for improvement. And another thing that's quite common with schools is that large projects, particularly anything, any project that causes that, that requires people to come in um, and work inside of classrooms. Usually those projects can only happen over the summer session um, so as to cause minimum disruption to school activities. So with a lot of community schools, they have a very short uh, window of time. It's usually just those two or three months in the summer when they can get these projects done. Um, and then the uh, the long budget cycles um, they they add to the process time as well. The next graph shows um, the energy consumption for that particular school. Um, actually, if you look at the total energy consumption, it wasn't that different from the other building. Um, so they were, I think the other building was at 1.6 million, the school is at one point five million, five, six million kilowatt hours. Um, and then since it had typical operations, um, nothing too strange about the uh, the profile. Um, they did have partial occupancy in the summer months, so that's why you see there's a slight dip here. And then um, this chart shows the energy by end use. Um, 
So this is mainly just to see which of the end uses have the most impact on the energy. Um, as you can see, since this is a project in Indiana, um, heating accounted for most of the energy end use, followed by lighting, cooling, and, uh, and fans. So with this particular school district, uh, I mentioned earlier that um, there wasn't really an energy efficiency plan for them. It was more about, you know, whatever they could do with the leftover dollars. It was, it was more reactive than proactive. Um, so by participating in a virtual energy assessment, um, it, it really put things in perspective for the facility and the energy managers. Um, it was good. They sat down and came to the understanding that a few projects had to be done two or three years from now. And then we essentially just help, uh, help, help them prioritize. Um, so based on what projects um, were, were most important, we split those into three different summers. So in the previous project, uh, we kind of did them more for from a bundle comparison in a good, better, best fashion. Um, for this particular school district, um, it was what they could accomplish over a three-year span. So the uh, energy manager had ad identified that a couple of projects needed to happen uh, immediately. Um, so we made sure that we modeled those for summer 2021. Actually, I think those projects are happening in that school district right now. Um, the first set of projects, I think they were just VFDs on the pumps and the fans, um, a little over $3,000 in savings. The more extensive project was the one that will be done um, in next year, involving a, a major mechanical equipment upgrade. And then uh, summer 2023, they had some leftover projects to do. And then this is the one that shows what the final um, energy consumption of the school would be. So they're going from $180,000 per year energy cost, uh, saving about 3000 in year one. And then at the end of year three, they'll be saving a little over $26,000 on their energy costs. Um, and of course, a one time, there's also a one time incentive from Duke Energy to help offset some of the project costs. Here is an example of um, what the what what strategies the uh, facilities manager and the energy engineer for that school district ended up choosing. Um, so there were some they wanted to do some quick small projects this summer. So just adding VFDs on the building heating pump and then the chilled water pump, um, and then they, they also wanted to add VFDs to the cooling tower fan. Um, and then they were going to handle the more extensive projects uh, in the in summer of 2022. So this chart shows the uh, energy savings that the uh, district would see over the years. Of course, this is only one school out of the 10 or so schools that were in the entire district. Um, so in summer 2021, they'll see about a three after summer 2021, they'll see a $3,000 reduction in energy costs. And then finally, they'll go up to $26,000 in energy cost savings. So from $180,000 annual energy cost, the school is projected to go down to about $154,000 energy cost at the end of three years. So what, what are some benefits of uh, a virtual energy analysis for community schools? Um, as mentioned earlier, um, be just because uh, the school's budget cycles are long, typically takes a while for large projects to get approval. Um, so the main benefit is really to help the school districts become more proactive on their energy, en on their energy approach instead of being reactive. A lot of times uh, uh, schools are only replacing equipment when it breaks. By creating an energy efficiency plan, um, 
they're able to get ahead of um, of that um, so they no longer need to um, deal with you know like failed equipment in the middle of school year instead they can uh, do a planned retirement of the major equipment and of course since uh, funding uh, since schools are funded with tax dollars budgets are usually quite tight so it may not be possible for a school district to do everything they want in year one so the virtual analysis also helps them do a bit more of a phased approach to handle handle these energy efficiency projects so that leads us to our last slide uh, quickly summarizing uh, virtual assessments and their benefits for educational institutions so virtual assessments definitely have their place however I don't think they will completely replace the traditional on-site energy audit because as we discussed in uh, pre earlier uh, there are definitely pros and cons for both and um, traditional audits uh, still have their place for more complicated uh, projects and uh, also for doing a more detailed analysis. There's a learning curve for building owners and facility managers however uh, post-pandemic era people are usually quite um, good with using um, online conference platforms and things like that so I would say the learning curve right now is maybe not as much as as it was pre-pandemic um, of course with advances in technology including VR, um, AR, AI um, it, uh, virtual assessments definitely have the uh, potential to become uh, the primary form of energy audits in the future. So that concludes our session on identifying energy savings in educational institutions through virtual audits. Um, if you guys are interested in enrolling your school district or your community college, uh, feel free to check out this link. Alternatively, you can also call this number. Um, and somebody from the customer service team will be happy to answer. Uh, thank you all for listening in. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to reach out to us either through uh, email or by phone. Thank you.